Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Will Pomeranz, and I'm acting director of the Kennett Institute. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us for a very pre uh, special presentation today to discuss recent, a recent analysis of the impact of Western economic sanctions on Russia. Uh, a few preliminary uh, comments. Uh, I encourage you all to stay up to date on the latest Kennan Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our two blogs, Focus Ukraine and The Russia File, as well as our podcasts, Kennan X and The Russia File. You can also visit our Hindsight Upfront Ukraine collection on the website for the latest news and analysis focused on Ukraine. If you have a question today, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom rather than raising your hands. We will be monitoring the Q&A throughout, uh, uh, throughout the event and we'll move to your questions following the presentations. Let me begin by introducing our speakers and allow them an opportunity to describe their work our first speaker is Vadim Denisenko, and he is the executive director of the Ukrainian Institute of for the Future. He is a journalist, a political scientist, and a politician. Prior to his current position, uh, Dr. Denisenko served as a member of the Committee on Legal Policy and Justice, a representative of, uh, of the Cabinet of Ministers in the Supreme Rada of Ukraine. Vadim, the floor is yours. Hello, hey, yeah. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> the dean, the floor you. is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, you know that 64 days ago, uh, Putin invited uh, to Ukraine, and if we speak right now about the sanctions against Russia, uh, we speak not, not only about economy, we speak not only about Ukraine-Russia uh, relationships. Uh, we speak about uh, the future of Ukraine as a state, and we speak about the Ukrainians as a nation. Uh, <clears throat> this research, the research of the uh, Ukrainian Institute for the Future, is uh, research about uh, the sanctions against Russia and uh, what is the results of these uh, sanctions. Uh, first of all, the stability of Russia currency and the budgetary system is determined <clears throat> by uh, its revenue from the energy exports. Oil and based and the oil based products it's about 40 percent of total export of goods uh, in uh, 2021 uh, natural gas it's approximately 10 11 percent in uh, <coughs> uh, the share of oil and gas revenues in the federal budget of the Russia uh, ranges from uh, 36 still uh, to 46 uh, and in some years it's uh, approximately 50% of Russian budget. If you speak about April, if you speak about three weeks of uh, April 2022, uh, I want to tell you that oil deliveries <coughs> from Russia to foreign ports fell by 20% uh, in the three, three weeks uh, of April, compared with the January, February period uh, before the invasion. Coal, if you speak about all energies, coal, uh, <coughs> increases uh, increased by 20 percent percent uh, LNG deliveries increased by 50 50 percent uh, deliveries of oil to the EU uh, fell by 20 percent in this period uh, the coal uh, approximately 40 percent uh, <coughs> uh, while deliveries of uh, LNG increased by 20 percent gas export to uh, European Union by pi pipelines increased by 10%. Uh, oil deliveries uh, to non-European uh, Union destinations increased approximately by 20%. Uh, and with major <coughs> uh, changes in uh, destinations. Uh, deliveries of coal and LNG outside the European U Union increased by 30% and 80% uh, respectively. The next slide, please. Uh, the volume, uh, volume of central banks of Russia Federation reserves uh, is uh, uh, 640 billion uh, dollars. Some of them were frozen due to, the, due to the sanctions. According to various estimates, uh, the central bank has uh, 200, 340 billion uh, at, its, at its disposal. 
According to all the generally accepted international uh, uh, criteria, the central bank's unfrozen reserves exceed uh, the level of sufficiency. Uh, during this week, uh, during this week, we have some uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, 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 some announcements from Russia. Chairman of uh, uh, the accounting chamber, Putin, told that additional costs of uh, stabilizing of, uh, uh, of Russia economy uh, will amount to more than 4 trillion rubles in 2022. Uh, inflation is expect expected uh, to rise to 20%. Uh, the fall in uh, GDP estimated 8-12%. Uh, uh, Minister of F Finance uh, Silvanov said uh, that Russia budget uh, deficit in 2022 will be 1.6 trillion rubles. But we have to know that the state fund for national welfare right now is 12.6 trillion rubles. Uh, the deficit will be uh, 1.6 and uh, the state uh, fund for national welfare 12.6 uh, rubles. Uh, real incomes of uh, Russians in the first uh, real incomes of Russians in the first quarter uh, quarter of 2022 decreased uh, by 1.2 percent. 1.2 percent. But we have to know that uh, <clears throat> three quarters ago. Uh, it grew 6.8% uh, <coughs> uh, uh, in the second quarter of 2021, 8.8% uh, in the third uh, quarter, and 0.5% uh, uh, in, uh, in the fourth quarter. That is why the fall doesn't look uh, critical for Russians right now. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Russia has a large positive trade uh, balance right now. Uh, uh, positive uh, trade balance in 2021 was 186 uh, billion dollars. Uh, in uh, the first two months of 2022, it's uh, 46 billion dollars. While maintaining maintaining the current price uh, situation, Russia trade surplus can uh, fluctuate at 18, 20 billion uh, uh, per month, or two, 220, 240 billion per year. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, <coughs> uh, Russia Federation budget for 22 uh, is uh, projected based on the following indications. It's very important for us. Uh, the project par uh, projected price for oil is 77.7 uh, for barrel. Uh, it's forecast for the Ministry of Econ Economic Development uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, and uh, the, rise, uh, the price for financing uh, uh, budget uh, expenditures is set at $44.2 uh, per barrel. Uh, right now, uh, we have to speak about the actual figures. In March, uh, it was uh, 95 uh, dollars per uh, barrel. Uh, today, uh, today price of uh, Ural's oil is 73.4. It's a little bit uh, less than estimated rate of uh, Russian forecast. But I want to emphasize: from every barrel, uh, budget has only 44 dollars. 44 dollars. Everything over this price is going to the fund of national uh, welfare. Today, it's 30 dollars uh, <coughs> is going to. Uh, the national uh, fund. The next uh, slide, please. Uh, if you speak about the factors that may critically affect uh, the Russian Federation budgetary stability, it's only two. First of all, it's oil prices, and the second one is uh, the embargo on oil uh, <coughs> from Europe or from Europe uh, and China, and secondary sanctions for uh, violation of the embargo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you speak about uh, the most significant blow from sanctions, uh, will affect such areas. First of all, it's aviation sector. It's a big problem right now in Russia. Uh, automotive industry, uh, some uh, plants uh, are stopped. They are, uh, are stopped. Engineering, electronic sector, 
uh, oil and gas sector, uh, if he speaks, uh, first of all, about the modernization, uh, <coughs> construction and uh, metallurgy. Uh, uh, in these areas, centuries are working, especially in electronic se sector. I want to uh, tell you something about electronic sector. It's maybe uh, uh, the best uh, situation if you speak about the sanctions against Russia. Uh, I can tell you only some last news from this uh, sphere. Uh, Russian uh, newspaper Commercial, uh, Commerçant reports about the big problems with the free space in Russian data centers and problem uh, with finding new equipment. Uh, problem with electronic uh, components and the general economic situation led to uh, the uh, refusal uh, of raw space to develop a flight program, uh, flight program uh, for the moon. Uh, 100,000 uh, specialists, approximately 100,000 uh, uh, specialists uh, in IT sphere are lived from Russia. Uh, all these stories is painful, but not critical for Putin's regime right now. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, uh, if you speak about uh, Russian economy, uh, we, we want to tell you that Russian economy goes into a free fall. Sanctions will have critical uh, consequences uh, on the quality and living uh, standards, standards uh, of uh, ordinary uh, Russians in the next uh, years, uh, accelerating the immigration processes uh, and uh, deepening the demogra uh, demo demographic uh, crisis. However, uh, the effect of uh, sanctions will be a long-term term trend, which does not pose a threat to the regime in the uh, nearest one, two years. The key sanctions against, against Russia, a full oil, um, uh, full oil embargo has not been imposed. As long as oil prices remain high, as Russia sells them, uh, there are no risks to the stability of the regime in Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vadim. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, Ilya Kusa. Ilya is a Kiev-based author and analyst of international relations with the Ukrainian Institute for the Future. For the past six years, he has been writing about the Middle East, Ukrainian foreign policy, and after, after 2014, and European politics. So Ilya, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will take it from here. and. Uh... I would like to add to what Vadim said, and actually, as, as Vadim said uh, already, uh, we, uh, besides sheer analysis of sanctions and their effect on, on Russia's economy and different and various industrial sectors, we also dedicated some time to analyzing uh, Russia's uh, political resiliency. So something that is connected to their uh, internal stability, which is also very important to understand here. And uh, in our opinion, we decided to focus on four uh, things uh, in this context. So uh, first of all, uh, this is, uh, yeah. So first of all, this is uh, low protest potential, integrity of elite groups, loyalty of the army and intelligence services and faith in, in Putin's, Vladimir Putin's personality. Now, I will try to explain uh, each of these uh, points, uh, each of these points. So first of all, when we speak about low protest potential, the problem here is that Russians, first of all, Russians are not ready to fight the system uh, in general. So there are, there are, of course, those groups of Russians who will suffer, uh, first of all, as a result of sanctions. These are mainly, these are mainly uh, businesses in big cities, especially. I mean, people who live in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg who have businesses, who have uh, foreign bank accounts, who used to travel a lot in Europe, in other countries, even to the United States, who have maybe businesses, I mean, in other countries. And so, and also uh, workers of those sectors that Vadim has already mentioned, the, the technological sector, the, the, the ones that are dependent on, on Western technology. Uh, besides that, I mean, in general, general Russian population, which estimate, which is estimated at approximately 60% of the population who 
who are very dependent on, on Russian, on the centralized state, and who uh, they are not, they are, they're more prone to sanctions, though, and they are not ready to fight the systems, the system. Anti-war sentiments in Russia are traditionally weak, so it's not a country where you have a very, you know, long, long record of, of, of uh, opposition towards wars. Uh, and uh, especially when come when it comes to I mean self perception of common Russians. Secondly, the problem also is that no opposition drivers. In other words, nothing drives opposition towards the system, as the political landscape was has been cleansed uh, during the last uh, fifteen years uh, by Vladimir Putin and his team. So you don't have uh, so. There are, you don't have uh, a robust opposition political network there besides, for example, except maybe the uh, the Alexei Navalny's fund, but first of all, Alexei Navalny is in jail. And secondly, they they can't, they're not visionaries. They are not a political opposition, you know, full in in 100% understanding of this, of this term. They don't have a vision of alternative political system in Russia. They, uh, they, they only reflect frustration by some people in Russia on, of because of corruption, because of general injustice of system, that's true. But again, this is only part of the society and not the, the biggest one. And secondly, of course, is that there is no clear alter there is no clear vision of an alternative future, which is worth to fight for. This is a very, in my opinion, this is very, this is critical because in Russia, there is an extremely bad memory of the 1990s. So generally Russians think that 90s were the years of humiliation for Russia, years when they, uh, when despite uh, the, uh, the so-called liberal democratic drive, uh, despite all of this, they didn't uh, get what they deserve. So they didn't get respect uh, or dignity in their view. I mean, something that they think Vladimir Putin gave them during the last years. Secondly, when we are talking about integrity of elite groups, uh, we also we, we don't see any signs of inter elitist struggle or, in, or or signs of internal coup coming you know, on Vladimir Putin in in the near future. At least this 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 hasn't been the case uh, during the last several weeks, uh, several, so during the last two months, and uh, when when the war started, uh, and we saw that there were some cracks among elite groups. So first of all, this concerned old liberal guard. So people who were around Vladimir Putin when he was around when he was only starting to gain power, especially people who were working with him during his years in Saint Petersburg, like Arkady Dvorkovich or Anatoly Chubais. But again, even here with these people, uh, they are not. We don't see that they decided to uh, to fight the system. So in all cases, I mean. Namely, in these two cases, both with Arkady Dvorkovich and Anatoly Chubais, who resigned, they uh, decided just to leave Russia, and that's also they decided to emigrate, not to position themselves as kind of you know I mean uh, to fight the system inside. And of course, so the initial impact of, sa of Western sanctions was that the elites uh, the elites started to consolidate around Vladimir Putin, and this is this is logical. So this is we we think that this is normal. This doesn't mean that they will be consolidated in the future. So this doesn't mean that they will all you know be close to Putin and be all together. Uh, this is the, this is always happening during sanctions during foreign pressure, and if, uh, this is something that happened in in Syria in Iran and in Venezuela, uh, but the, the longer the sanctions uh, pressure the country, the more, uh, it, the more it is likely that the elite groups will start to, to, you know, there will be problems among them. But right now, we, we haven't seen any indicators of, you know, major problems for Putin in terms of integrity of, you know, elite groups around him. Loyalty of the army and intelligence services is, uh, well, in, in our opinion, it's uh, pretty high, at least among high-level officers. Because these are the people that that are mainly re that mainly represent uh, army and and especially intelligence services, intelligence agencies in Russia. 
Uh, of course, uh, the mil military in Russia, it's not a separate institution like we see in some Middle Eastern or North African countries, but we think that special services, intelligence services, they could be seen like something like that because they have more power traditionally because Vladimir Putin is one of them and he, he came from, from uh, the former KGB. And uh, there, are certain, uh, there are certain differences uh, inside the intelligence community in Russia. Uh, we actually, we have been noticing them for some time since 2014, uh, because there were differences between, for example, Russian GRU, the military intelligence and FSB, uh, when it came to, to the questions of how to control the, uh, the Donbass uh, breakaway regions, which were uh, partly occupied by Russia in 2014. And so, uh, so these, these differences, they remain, and, uh, but still, as of today, we don't see that uh, sanctions led to, to worsening of the situation and all relations between them. But this is a possibility in the future. And also uh, why something that could explain why uh, Russian soldiers, Russian army, and actually part of, part of Russian public is, are not mad at what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine and elsewhere is that uh, Russians are less, uh, let's say, they're less sensitive when it comes to human casualties. I mean, this is something that, 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 that is, uh, uh, been observed by many actually uh, colleagues, so we're not the first to say about this, that the threshold, the sensitivity threshold to human casualties is lower, of course, than in Europe, for example, or the United States or in Ukraine, actually. And also the total control of the media, which gives uh, Vladimir Putin and Russian government the possibility to, you know, underscore what is happening in Ukraine also you know, plays an important role in that. So that Russia, not many Russians, they don't know the the, the, the the scale, the scope of what is going on in Ukraine. And the last one is uh, the faith, faith in Vladimir Putin's personality. This is something that we also uh, think critical to understanding Russian political resilience of Russia's system. Uh, Russia's social contract, which is uh, you give us legitimacy and we give you the feeling of, pride and, you know, and, and some kind of justice in, in their view uh, is almost entirely fixated around the, around Vladimir Putin, his figure, his image, uh, his something that, that people seem to call political heritage of Putin after 1990s. And uh, this is, uh, and unless, so unless his image is shattered in the eyes of general public, or where he suffers, for example, a humiliating military defeat in Ukraine, where he couldn't name anything as a victory in Ukraine. Uh, unless this happens, it is unlikely that people's faith in him would, would diminish quickly under sanctions pressure, so under Western pressure. And uh, so, so this, is the, this is the key thing when the Putin's ability to maintain his, to maintain this form of political resilience uh, stems from, you know, something that we call his opportunistic position, like something that mm -hmm. he he calls that that he made Russia be, you know, more stronger, stronger. He made Russia. He he's portraying himself as the leader who is against all the world practically, and who is trying to build a more, uh, you know, a more just world in which Russia will be represented in a more dignified way. It's something which he understands, and, and this is something that appeals to many Russians. So unless this image is shattered, uh, we cannot say that, 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 that the political stability in Russia will be in, in much trouble. So it will remain so unless, uh, until people believe in Putin personally, this is very. This is this is the most important. So Putin personally, it doesn't matter what people will think about the government, the parliament. I mean, some leaders of, for example, parliamentary delegations in in in, in state Duma in in Moscow, or or some uh, minist ministers, for example. This it it doesn't matter. So all that matters is Putin's personal image in the eyes of the general public. And so when it comes to Russia's weak spots, we, uh, what we found is that there are several of them actually. So first of all, it's the young urban generation, which, uh, which is something that the central authorities in Russia don't know what to do. So there is a great generation gap between 
between uh, Russia's older people and younger people. Uh, younger people, they they tend they are more more connected to the Western world. They are more they don't they more they know more. They have the means to know more. They have the access to different services and means of communication and information. And this is something that the central authorities still don't know in Russia how to communicate with them, how to appeal to them. And uh, this is one of Russia's weak spots in the future. This is one of social these this is one of social groups that could actually uh, pose a threat to to Russia's political regime in some in some time in the future. Uh, the second one is Putin centered system. So on one hand, yes, uh, the whole political resilience of Russia is fixated on Vladimir Putin, but this is his weakness because in all such systems, everything is dependent on the political leader. The moment the political leader is being is 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 being weakened in the eyes, even weakened in the eyes of the general public, the system will the system starts to collapse. Radical nationalist groups, which actually were marginalized under Putin, this is uh, especially, for example, the the radical na the radical nationalists were always. I mean, because we we sometimes forget that. Uh, Besides that, that Putin's Russia uh, tried to silence not only liberal democratic forces that we used to read about this in the news, like Navalny or any others, but by the way, Navalny is also can be considered a nationalist in some way, and actually this is how he started. But also these radical nationalist groups were also uh, not very welcomed, you know, among the, the general Russian internal politics, and this is something. Now, when you have this kind of military hysteria in Russian media, when the when everything is polarized inside Russia, these groups they started to gain prominence, and uh, Russian uh, authorities they they are forced to deal with them in in one or another way, and this is this is this is Russia's current system weak spot because they also don't because these groups they are also although they have some ties to Russian uh, high level officials, but they are not part of this system. They, they are more radical. They think that the system should be more aggressive, more radical. And this is something that is a threat to Putin personally also. National mobilization, this is something that, uh, that we were, we've been talking for some time that Russians are trying to avoid national mobilization of their territories. They're trying to avoid mobilizing people for the war in Ukraine because uh, Russians tend to uh, to uh, like war only when it when it's on TV. So they like to feel you know pride in some or, or for their country, which you know crushes enemies somewhere abroad. But they don't like to when when the war comes to their homes when they need to mob to be mobilized to go to war. So the morale among the general public is pretty low. That's why Russians, for example, are trying to avoid this topic in, in the media. They're trying to avoid it by all means to announce mobilization, even now, for example, when uh, when uh, military hostilities sometimes uh, sometimes covers even their territory, which which we'll now see. I mean, the, ter the territory is bordering Ukraine. They are started to be to to be shelled, and this is something. And they need to explain this uh, to their people. But they are still trying to avoid national mobilization, uh, preferring to bring forces from from Siberia, from Vladivostok, or or Transnistria or other countries. Uh, time, which is really something that Russia, uh, which is really, I mean, this is this is uh, the, the sanctions. The sanctions policy uh, is about time. So the longer the sanctions are preserved, the weaker Russia will become, especially in terms of technological gap, which will widen in time. And of course, the relationship, uh, the relationship with regional elites, which is um, which is still something that. Moscow is still trying to is is ma maintain its control over regional elites. Uh, since from 2016 to 2020, there was a mass purge among regional governors, uh, which were replaced with uh, people main, predominantly from Moscow. So officials, politicians who are close to Moscow administration, to to a president's administration or elites in Moscow, and except several regions like Chechnya, where Ramzan Kadyrov is still the leader of Chechnya, but others, there was really a, a large scale campaign to replace all governors. 
And still this, and, and th at that time, this caused stir between central authorities and regional elites. And we think that it's still the case, but, the, but for the time being, central authorities maintain control of the regional elites, but we think that the more sanctions will pressure, uh, will pressure uh, Russia, the, the, the less the market will become, the more uh, their relationship will become, uh, will, will fall into under conflict. And the last is that we have, uh, we think that there would, there is, there is a possibility of uh, a conflict between among national elite groups. Uh, I was talking about that. That that's for as of now, we don't see major, uh, you know, major conflicts among different elite groups. So now they're consolidated around Putin. This is the initial reaction to the to the sanctions from the West. But in time, especially when we're talking about medium term and long term periods, uh, we think that uh, these groups will start to to try to will 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 start to save themselves first of all, because for now they think that they that with Putin they have they have this kind of faith in in that they will get from this city get out of this situation in the near future. And as a result of sanctions, we think that uh, conflict is would be immediate among among different elites. I mean, this is something that ever that happens every time when you have a besieged state. I mean, or, or a country which is which sees itself in in the state of you know of a siege, and uh, you know decrease in 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 resources. The 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 uh, will 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 immediately lead to. Uh, national elites starting to, uh, you know, think how to, so part of them will start to think how to get out, part of them will start to think how to maybe change the situation inside Russia, so as not to, so for the country not to collapse. Uh, some of them will try to seize power, maybe when they will think that Putin is not the leader they thought he could be, he, could, he was. And so this is something that, but this is something that we think will happen in medium and long term period. Unless there is something that Vadim was talking, an oil embargo or a full energy embargo, which will crush Russia's economy uh, quickly, like in in this in the spare spate of one two months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilya. Um, I just want to remind our viewers that if you have any questions, please use the Q and A feature in Zoom rather than raising your hand. Uh, we are monitoring the Q&A throughout the event, and we'll move to your questions following the presentations. Uh, our last speaker will provide some commentary on the report. Uh, she is Oksana Antoninko, uh, who is a global fellow at the Kennan Institute. She has spent over 20 years analyzing Russian politics and foreign policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the London School of Economics, and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She is based in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Um, Oksana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. And uh, thank you for including me in this uh, very interesting discussion. I have to um, say, first of all, it's a great pleasure to uh, cooperate with uh, Ukraine's Institute uh, uh, of the Future, uh, certainly despite, despite of all the dark times that we are all going through. Today, we certainly, I certainly believe that Ukraine has a very bright future and uh, um, uh, a fantastic future as a part of Europe. Um, so, uh, I would like to say, uh, you know, a few words about the report. So, I have to say that I found the report extremely interesting. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's very objective in my view. It's very uh, well argued and 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 balanced. Uh, in many ways, it's a great credit, I think, for to our authors that, to be able to write that sort of balanced report in the current circumstances. Um, of this ongoing conflict. Uh, and uh, um, I think it is uh, really very helpful, uh, you know, it really to provide this, uh, you know, rather, you know, cool headed, um, uh, in some ways, maybe uncomfortable message for many of us who are trying to see how the sanctions fit in within the broader policy. Um, I think it is a, a very useful resource for all the policymakers out there to be able to really see and understand what is happening in Russia today and how to use them uh, use this report for informing policy. What I guess I'm missing a little bit from this report is really the so what um, question um, at the end. I think the, the, the recommendations 
uh, and, uh, 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 rather short, and I'll, I'll say a few words about it uh, later on. And also maybe what a bit missing from the report from my perspective is a bit of a context to really try to understand and give us your perspective of what are the uh, objectives of the sanctions and, and what is the purpose of the sanctions and how do you really see the sanctions really fitting in within what you described very well, um, the kind of evolution of Russia's economic and political system. So let me maybe start by giving you a bit of a, you know, my 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 view to 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 supplement the the the, arg the arguments in the report, you know, about uh, what is the purpose of the sanctions. Maybe then look a little bit at the broader picture, which is covered in the report, but you didn't cover in your presentation. But I think is extremely critically important that we are not just talking about the Western sanctions here. We are talking about the rest of the world, and we still see quite a big part of the world uh, sitting on the fence at the moment, and what it really means in terms of the. Uh, you know, opportunity for uh, those sanctions to have a meaningful impact. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, I'll just say a few words about specifically on the kind of political side of things that Ilya was talking about now. So initially, you know, what really are the sanctions for? And I think we need to be very realistic and clear uh, in answering this question. Um, you know, just over the po over the course of the um, uh, you know recent uh, months, you know, initially. Um, the policymakers in the West in particular were trying to use sanctions, the sort of threat of sanctions as a deterrence uh, to prevent you know, Russia from um, uh, taking that you know, military aggression against Ukraine. Uh, and we know, of course, that sanctions as a deterrence, the threat of sanctions as a deterrence did not work because we are seeing what we are seeing today, the conflict you know, ongoing in the worst possible scenario that we could anticipate from the beginning. So, and from this deterrence factor, we now really move to the new other extreme, I think, is to really looking at sanctions purely as, as a punishment. You know, so sanction is as, as response to what Russia is doing, all the horrible atrocities that we are seeing, you know, all the things that are happening on the ground. And we are just trying to apply sanctions, you know, increasingly, I would say, indiscriminately and tactically, just looking at the, um, you know, let's do more and more sanctions that we can do at the moment, but really not trying to take a bit more of a, um, uh, I would say, uh, you know, strategic view and, 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 and more detailed view of really to understand how the, to tailor those sanctions to be able to deliver important objectives for Ukraine, important objectives for the West. And what really are those objectives? And I see, you know, three objectives that sanctions could serve and should serve, in my view, in, in, in the current situation. The first one, of course, to to try to bring about the ceasefire as soon as possible and to ceasefire, which actually serves, of course, the, 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 the interest of Ukraine and preserves Ukraine's you know, territorial integrity and, and sovereignty, but also, of course, you know, uh, minimizes the, uh, uh, the cost and, and the threat to life. So at the moment, the way the sanctions are structured at the moment, you know, we really do not see uh, any evidence that the sanctions have so far you know, contributed to this objective, nor do I think is likely uh, in the medium term perspective. And I think the description from Vadim about the uh, economic resilience that Russia still has for the coming months, and certainly from Eliyahu about the political resilience, really shows us that we, if we carry on just on this path, you know, as we are at the moment, it's unlikely that the sanctions is going to contribute to that uh, objective. The second objective is, you know, trying once the ceasefire is achieved, to you know, uh, compel Russia to implement uh, this agreement. And we know, of course, with the Minsk I and Minsk II agreements that implementation potentially is going to take much longer period of time and will be even more problematic than the achieving the agreement itself. Uh, again, we need to think about here, how do we use sanctions both as a punishment, but also as a deterrence, as the incentivizing you know, this uh, process of implementing the agreement whenever this agreement is going to appear. And finally, I think the third objective, which is much more longer term one, is really how to make sure that you know, the threat from Russia in the longer term is not uh, going to emerge not only for Ukraine, but you know, more broader uh, for, for the West and for the international community, but also perhaps you know, bring about what Elia was describing here, you know, some sort of transformation within Russia itself, which, you know, in the longer run, clearly, is the biggest guarantee, the best guarantee that this threat doesn't materialize again. Um, and, and again, sort of in that sense, you know, the sanctions at the moment are not clearly tailored to, you know, really think about how those, those, those objectives can be achieved. And, and, and I think, you know, we really need to be starting thinking about it already now, not just as a, as a longer term perspective. 
Another, another uh, point to, to mention here is this timeline. And I think the report is putting it very, very well, about how you know, we really are looking at the moment at a short-term resilience. Yes, you know, Russia is impacted by sanctions, but the economy is still able to you know, function because of high oil prices and the society is having this rallying around the flag effect. But you know, once we move from a short-term uh, impact, you know, we are now have to be looking at the medium-term effect uh, impact as well as a longer term. Of course, you know, we anticipating the sanctions are going to remain in place for a long time, and a lot of sanctions around the technology exports controls, around the um, uh, you know uh, financial sanctions, etc., are likely to have a more longer-term impact. But I, I would argue that already in the medium term, and really we are looking towards the end of summer, autumn time. You know, Russia will have to start to be experiencing quite substantial structural um, uh, pressures on its economy. And we've heard it not only from the analysts, we've heard it from the Russian government itself, you know, from uh, head of the central bank, Elvira uh, Nebiulina just recently gave a presentation where she she admitted that if we are looking at the third to fourth quarter of this year, we're already going to see very substantial macroeconomic pressures. We're going to have, of course, you know, substantial impacts on the uh, quality of life, on real incomes, on unemployment is likely to increase very substantially. And of course, also given the trajectory of the uh, reduction imports uh, into Russia, we are likely to see shortages in, in, in many uh, goods, not only high technology goods, but also maybe some basic goods as well. So, so the impacts of sanctions are already likely to be uh, felt you know, in, in the medium term. So, so the kind of picture that the report has paints at the moment, you know, at least on the economic side, I think will be overtaken by events you know, relatively soon. However, you know, I totally agree with the authors that we have to be cool Headed about the fact that you know not anticipating you know full Russian economic collapse you know within the space of of, of uh, several months or maybe potential several several years. And the final point I want to make is you know what I refer to is this kind of global sanctions problem. Uh, and the report, as I said, you know describes it very well. It wasn't included in the presentation today, but I think it's a very important point that for the time being we see most of the sanctions are just limited to. Uh, G7 countries, European Union, um, uh, and, and maybe kind of a, a West more broadly. But, you know, the majority of the countries in, in the world are still sitting on the fence. You know, at best, you can describe their position as neutral. Uh, but at worst, I think many of them just really do not see that conflict as their conflict or uh, as the report very well, I think, uh, uh, concludes, I totally agree with that conclusion that they see it as a kind of almost a natural part of the evolution of the global geopolitical system or being part of a conflict between the West and China. Um, uh, uh, but I think it is very important to understand what role will uh, the rest of the world play if those sanctions are sustained and we are not going to see the ceasefire anytime soon uh, and, and and in that sense the the objective of, of both you know the West and Ukraine is to make sure that you know that kind of uh, uh, you know neutrality uh, is not there in the long run because clearly if it is that uh, Russia will be able to uh, mitigate uh, and soften the impact of san sanctions quite substantially and here I'm particularly looking at China of course which is likely to continue even though China has taken in somewhat neutral position on this conflict but it's clear that China is going to increase very substantially its economic relationship with Russia, influence, economic influence in Russia probably is going to take control on some important assets within Russia, including in the energy sector. And we are seeing other reports just today, you know, reports that India might be considering buying part of the assets, you know, in Rosneft, you know, following the, the, the exit of, uh, of uh, Western uh, energy companies like BP or, or Exxon from various projects. So we are seeing, you know, major uh, uh, emerging powers, uh, you know, emerging countries, you know, are, no, are not really prepared at this stage to take a stand on the sanctions. Uh, and that will present, you know, limitations on, on, on how much sanctions are going to be effective and being able to achieve the kind of objectives I talked about at the start. But, you know, just let me finish here and I just say that it's really excellent report. I recommend it to everyone who is on the call to read it and um, really great uh, uh, tribute to the authors of this report. Thank you very much, Oksana. Um, a reminder again, we're gonna to get to your questions soon, but if you wanna ask a question, uh, you can submit it using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, I'm gonna let these uh, authors answer some of Oksana's points that she raised uh, and then go to questions. 
Uh, I especially want to hear their analysis and, and more detail about the argument of Oksana and the rest of the world sitting on the fence, because I think this is a very important part of how sanctions are going to develop and whether they're going to have an impact. Um, I also just want to ask one follow-up question about Putin and his resilience. Uh, obviously, it's very hard to do polling in Russia uh, today, and the polls show a high rate of, of support for Putin, but to what extent can these polls be trusted, basically? Uh, how secure is Putin's popularity, uh, especially since uh, there are considerable losses that he is trying to hide in Ukraine. Uh, and you, Russians, uh, at least in previous in, uh, engagements, uh, have protested. Uh, indeed, I remember the mother's committees in Chechnya uh, who went to get their sons out of the army uh, during the Chechen war. So uh, questions about, if you could comment more about uh, the countries on the fence, and really the ways to evaluate Putin's popularity. I think Vadim could, Vadim, I think you should answer about Putin and I will then continue. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, if you speak about uh, the Putin's popularity, uh, we have to start from uh, 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, uh, Ilya told uh, that uh, 19th, uh, 1919th, it was uh, uh, the period of humiliation for Russia and a lot of people in Russia uh, thought that it was uh, the, uh, um, the period of uh, greatest humiliation for uh, Russian people uh, all over the history. And uh, <clears throat> uh, his, uh, if you speak about his uh, internal policy, if you speak about his, uh, uh, about the roots of his popularity, we have to tell about uh, some uh, main uh, points. First of all, uh, it's TV. First of all, it's TV. Uh, 20 years ago, he uh, decided that all Russian TV will be uh, pro-Putin, pro-Putin uh, pro regime TV. Uh, and what uh, they did 20 years ago, they decided to uh, divide all peoples for groups. Uh, the groups who like, uh, for example, women 40, 40 plus, and uh, they want to hear only about uh, the problems of women 40 plus. And in general, they will hear about the Putin, Putin, and Putin. Uh, if you want to, <coughs> Uh, live in conspiracy theories. Uh, he, uh, you have a TV channel, совершенно secret. It's uh, absolutely secret, and it's two percent of people. But uh, there is an oligarch who will sponsor, uh, who will pay for, uh, and point uh, two, uh, two persons of uh, Russians will hear about the conspiracy theories and uh, about Putin, and so on. Uh, and that is why they built a great TV uh, propaganda machine uh, for all Russians. 100% of Russians, uh, of uh, Russian people, had this uh, kind of propaganda. It's first of all. Uh, the second one, uh, <clears throat> uh, in 1990, uh, Boris Yeltsin told that right now uh, Russia is standing up for, uh, from Nice. Uh, and it's the main slogan of uh, Putin's regime. It's uh, like a joke that uh, Yeltsin's phrase is a slogan for Putin's regime, but uh, uh, Russia's are, uh, growing, uh, are standing up from uh, Nice. And all of this, uh, all of uh, Putin's propaganda, all of Putin's uh, um, uh, popularity, uh, uh, stands on uh, this slogan because every time, uh, every day, uh, in the school, in the university, uh, in uh, your plants, in your agriculture farms, uh, you'll hear that we are standing up and uh, 
everything which uh, do which did or do Putin is uh, doing for uh, standing up. <sighs> I told you about the humiliation, and uh, they are uh, taking off this humiliation, but uh, standing up. And uh, the third one, uh, <clears throat> the third point, the third point is. Um, uh, is a propaganda point that uh, you don't need uh, to have a, a good, uh, rich life. It's better for you to proud for your country, uh, and the proud of country is better than uh, one million dollars. And it's three. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to tell you in a two minutes about uh, all this uh, propaganda machine. But as for me, it's main three points of. Uh, uh, popularity of Putin. Thank you, Vadim. Uh, Ilya, we'll turn to you uh, for a brief answer. We have a lot of people in, in the queue for questions. So uh, brief comments, and then we'll get to, to the questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I will only reflect on the, on the, uh, on the issue which uh, Oksana raised. And uh, yes, this is really an important one about the other half of the world, let's let's call it, and because this is something that actually Ukraine has found quite surprising, because you know for many years in Ukraine uh, it was the ten it, we tended not to uh, not to analyze deeply what is happening in the east or south. I mean, because we were fixated on the on, on west. I mean, on Europe, on the United States, and the partnership and the priority was given to these countries till today. And now when the war started and, uh, you know, we all started to, to discuss and analyze even among ourselves on what is going on, how the world reacts, how other countries react to what is going on in Ukraine, how much they know about Ukraine, you know, and we, yeah, this is something that, what happened is that we found that really the position uh, when it comes to sanctions, especially when it comes to trying to uh, block or, um, I don't know how to how to put it to to uh, I mean, see, to besiege some some country, especially the uh, Russia. I mean, such such big country as Russia, you need you you need all countries to participate. Ideally, of course, and we found that the position of many uh, let's say Eastern countries or country or or countries of global South are not less no less important than the position of Western countries. And I think that the main, uh, the main point here is that, at least what I see, uh, that many countries, many non-Western countries like China, India, Turkey, uh, uh, Gulf monarchies, they see, first of all, yes, as Oksana has already pointed out, they see this war not as the war between Russia and Ukraine, not as some kind of conflict between Moscow and Kiev, you know, deeply entrenched in history or something like that. They don't know about that. They don't know about history of Russia-Ukraine relations. They see it as conflict between Russia on one side and West on the other side. So they see it mainly as Russian-American conflict in some, in some cases, like Chinese, for example. If we analyze their media, they're portraying this conflict as like, you know, Russians are trying to, uh, to you know, are, are waging a proxy war against the United States and vice versa. So something like that. And the second problem here is that uh, they, they think they don't want to join sanctions because for them, what is happening is that, is that this is a precedent which would come to them. I mean, because many of these countries, especially China or, or India, for example, I mean, which found themselves at odds often with the United States, with the West. So they didn't have this kind of prolonged relationship. They didn't, they don't belong to the Western world. They think, I mean, in their, in, in their perception is that why should we support sanctions, which at some point in future, because the precedent is there, would be uh, in some day they would be aimed against us maybe. When, for example, there will be an escalation between, for example, China and the US, which is already happening as we see, and this will be something that will determine international relations for the next century, for, for the next uh, you know, couple of dozen years, I think. 
And the third one, the final point, I think that they don't want to join sanctions because of political and ideological reasons. So not because they love Putin, not because they support Russia, not because they think that Russia, that war in Ukraine is justified. Many of them, they don't think it's justified. Uh, like in Pakistan or India or in the United Arab Emirates, many, uh, well, many think that I have, my understanding is that they don't think that this war is, is, is good especially for them. But they think that joining by joining sanctions, joining Western-led sanctions will put them in a position when they will say, when they will somehow, you know, be part of Western efforts. For example, for China, which sees itself as an alternative global power, or for Turkey, which sees itself as an emerging global power in some future, they think that this is something they cannot, they cannot accept. They cannot go with somebody, un especially under pressure, when, for example, the United States says to India, you need to join, you must join our sanctions. And the immediate answer is something like, we, we, we don't have to do that. We, we see ourselves as, as an alternative regional or global player, like, like the, the not long ago uh, resigned Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan said when he was gathering a rally in Islamabad, he said exactly that, that we're not, he said that we're not slaves to the West, so that we'll, so we'll not join sanctions. So, so, this, so this is a pure political and ideological thing here. And I think that the war in Ukraine will certainly divide, so will lead, lead to more division between West and East. Uh, so I don't see that it will unify uh, the world in this case. I think there will be more division between this, you know, to, uh, uh, to, well, collective West and collective East. I mean, we can call it something like that. So yes, and this is a problem for Ukraine because of course, when it comes to sanctions pressure, you need everyone on board, especially when you have China, which, is, which consumes a great bulk of Russian energy uh, resources. And without China, even a full total energy embargo on behalf of, of Western kind of European of European countries could be not enough. It could not be, I mean, could not be enough in media on the long-term perspective. We don't know that. It will be, it will be a, a, a very hard blow to Russian economy, but maybe it will still be not enough because China and India and other countries will continue working with Russia because they see it as their right, as their sovereign right to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to go to questions. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the queue. So my only uh, request is that we keep the questions as uh, answers as short and direct as possible so we can get to as many questions uh, from our audience. Uh, and I will kind of abbreviate some of the questions. Uh, I apologize if, if I shorten them too much, but I want to get through a lot of them. So the first question is from Paul Sarno. And he talks about uh, a question about the dollar ruble rate and a question as to when do you think we can see a decline in the ruble? I don't know, maybe Vadim. Uh, uh, repeat please, when can we see what? When, when do you anticipate a significant decline in the value of the ruble? The ruble has ruble. been, the ruble, uh, has, has, yes, has, has remained relatively stable. Uh, we, we had thought that there would be a dramatic decrease, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, why is that? Uh, first of all, we have to tell that uh, a very professional uh, central bank in uh, Russia, first of all. Uh, it's uh, the first point. The second point, uh, they made a lot of uh, restrictions uh, for uh, foreign currency uh, in Russia in the first period. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, the <clears throat> uh, Russian government, Russian central bank, uh, controlled uh, 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 control every uh, currency movement uh, in Russia. And that is why they can restrict uh, uh, Everything um, and no, we name it to dry to dry uh, the monetary uh, politics. Uh, I don't know this English term in Ukraine. It's to dry to dry. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, the second one, uh, they have a big, a very huge uh, reserves uh, uh, in uh, National Bank. Uh, they have a huge uh, reserves in uh, welfare uh, national uh, funds. Uh, and uh, they have a very good situation with uh, prices for oil and gas. And that is why uh, they have uh, uh, a good possibility to uh, keep ruble in uh, these in these ranks. Thanks. Um... Our next I, mean, question. I can maybe add, you know, oh, very quickly to please, that, just please, to say that, please, uh, please. you know, of course, uh, you know, the, you know, the key, the key reasons why the ruble is remaining stable, just as Vadim said, that there are capital controls which don't allow currency to go out of Russia, and then the exporters who are exporting oil, they then have to convert all the money that they are receiving, and hence, you know, all these discussions about being paid in rubles for the sale of oil or gas, you know, you know, into in, into the uh, rubles. So they prop up the currency while before they, they weren't. But of course, you know, if you go to the Russian commercial banks at the moment, the ruble exchange rate is very different. So it's not the same as it was, you know, um, uh, before the crisis, you know. So yes, I, I, you know, officially the central bank is keeping the, the ruble rate you know, strong, but, uh, but, but, but the banks and for ordinary people, and of course the demand for currency has also fallen because people are no longer traveling abroad. So there is, uh, you know, and the imports, there is, you know, fewer imports, you do not need to pay in currency for, for, for importing. So, so all of those factors, but that's only short-term impact. I think the consensus among experts is that the ruble is going to weaken quite substantially towards the end of the year. And I think that's what Nabiulin also was hinting at her last presentation to the parliament. So you're clearly expecting, you know, ruble to weaken at some point uh, throughout the course of this year. Uh, I can add uh, that uh, the official, uh, uh, officially they told that uh, the inflation will be 20%. It's official right now, 20% in this year will be uh, the inflation. Thanks. Um, our next question comes from Violetta uh, Habibulina, uh, and she is uh, talking about uh, not only sanctions, but the interaction between Russian and Western academics. Uh, do you think basically that Russia has been isolated not only from international markets, but from the global think tank world? And to what extent is Russia still utilizing its connections uh, to Russian and Western scholars and businessmen? Yeah, maybe you. Yeah, I think, yeah, 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 I can, I think I can briefly uh, comment on that well as far as uh, we didn't go deep to that i mean to that topic i mean of the scientific ties uh, of the academic ties russia has with different parts of the world but i can tell that of course uh, now we we have seen in the news also right? it was in the news that many uh, think tanks uh, and and a lot of academic ties that russians used to have with western universities and think tanks they are being uh, cut due to not due to sanctions because sanctions do not you know prohibit these ties but because of this informal boycott which many companies and, and universities are are imposing in russia because of the war uh, but from the other side again this this returns us to this question of the other part of the world because when you see uh, uh, because when when you analyze the different conferences including online conferences that russian think tanks hold sometimes like paul dai club for example uh, they have, well, well, many guests and many participants from uh, non-Western countries are still there. I mean, so again, here we, we again, we have this, this kind of division, let's say, between the West and the East, as in commercial ties, when you have Western countries boycotting Russia and Eastern countries enhancing your know, trade, because they see, uh, some of them even see this as an opportunity, because you know, Western companies go out, we, we're going in, and the same is going on in, uh, as I, my understanding is that the same is going on with uh, in, inter, inter-university ties and ties between think tanks, uh, which, so I see a growing number of, for example, of um, Chinese, Indian, Iranian, other uh, experts or scholars, you know, still participating in, in Russian events and conferences so i think this will this will 
this will be the case. So it will be the division. Some, we will see the two pictures, which are very different from the West and the East. And I can add, uh, uh, I can add that uh, I think we've lost Vadim. So I'm just going to go to another question, and yeah. Vadim hopefully will 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 get Vadim back to to add to that question. Uh, my the next question is from David Edict. And he, he asks, at what point will Western sanctions become, become, will be, at what point will Western sanctions be perceived as an economic war against Russia? How will the Rus Russia public respond to such a war? Well, I think, I think they already called it an economic war. There, there was a statement from Dmitry, Dmitry Medvedev is if I'm not mistaken, who called it an economic war that the West wages against Russia. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe I can add to this one just to say that, uh, of course, you know, Russia has a limited opportunity to, to, to respond to sanctions. You know, we've seen already some, uh, you know, statements that came out uh, from the Russian side, you know, threatening, for example, to seize the assets of the foreign companies that are, you know, stopping their operations in Russia or leaving Russia uh, or, you know, introduce counter sanctions. But of course, you know, Russia still accounts only for about 3% of global GDP or some estimates even put at, at a lower level. So, so to have a kind of a, a strategic impact uh, or on Western economy is very limited. But of course, we still have a, a lot of interdependence between Europe and Russia in the energy sector. But, uh, you know, we are seeing very rapidly how the European Union, even though I agree that, you know, we do not have a uh, oil embargo and it's unlikely to come uh, or gas embargo in the short term, you know, clearly by the end of this year, and I know it sounds like a very long time uh, given what's happening on the battlefield, but still, you know, by the end of this year, I think European Union is going to very substantially, and I would uh, underscore irreversibly, so, sort of structurally reduce its dependence on uh, Russian oil very substantially, almost entirely and on Russian gas by two thirds. So this is a structural change, which is not gonna go away no matter what is gonna happen in Ukraine and, and something which Russia has to take into account, but its ability to um, uh, react and respond uh, in this environment will be even more limited because it's, uh, you know has a very limited uh, role in the global economy. Thank, uh, so, sorry for the interruption. Uh, one follow-up question though on that subject, uh, it's from Paul Sarno, and he asks whether Russia can find other customers for their oil and gas. Oksana or? Well, I, I, I can answer, but I'm sure Vadim also can answer. But, you know, the, um, um, you know, for, for, for oil, for oil, it is a little bit easier because, of course, oil is mostly transported, you know, by sea. So some of it by pipeline. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, Russia can potentially start selling oil, but uh, particularly given that, uh, you know, Russian oil is now being sold with very substantial discount. And this is where we are talking about the rest of the world. You know, for example, already now, you know, the oil is being sold, uh, you know, uh, at about 30-35% discount, but still there are limitations, you know, Russian, uh, because of the sanctions at the moment applied on the shipping, on the insurance sector, quite a lot of brokers are not buying deliberately Russian oil. So, so I think before very long, Russia is going to face a situation where it actually needs to start closing wells because it cannot, you know, keep that store that oil, you know, which is not finding its way on the global market. In the natural gas area, it's even more complicated because clearly you cannot um, uh, divert a pipeline gas, you know, um, from Europe to Asia at the moment. The only pipeline which Russia has built into China is uh, coming from Eastern Siberia, but the gas uh, it's exporting to Europe comes from West Siberia. So it needs to build an additional pipeline, which is, you know, at the moment sort of officially is in the planning phase, but of course it's going to take years and years to build. Uh, and it is not even clear to what extent, you know, this demand is going to be there by that stage when the pipeline is built, because increasingly natural gas in the context of the energy transition is no longer seen as a destination fuel. So therefore, you know, unless Russia finds very quickly an alternative, if it builds a pipeline 10, 
10 years from now, the demand is going to be much lower. So it's not going to be able to very quickly find an alternative. But even if it only sells, you know, half of what it can sell um, to the international market, um, you know, uh, it still will be able to uh, maintain largely probably close to the, uh, you know, balanced current account because of the imports, substantial reduction of imports uh, and other, you know, expenditures. So um, the just the kind of a oil embargo from once uh, or, you know, reducing oil supplies to one side is not enough, I think, to uh, strategically undermine the economy in the short run. I don't know if Vadim agrees or... Well, in general, I agree with you, but... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we have to understand that uh, right now uh, the main problems, uh, if you speak about the oil uh, productive in uh, Russia, is the main problem is uh, uh, some uh, have some campaigns. It's first of all Luke oil and uh, Tatneft, uh, because they have a very old um, uh, uh, wells. wells. Well. Yes, yeah. wells. Yes, yes. Thank you. A very old wells, and uh, it's impossible. Uh, and uh, Luke Oil uh, had a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, attitudes with the USA and uh, the Western Europe. Uh, and uh, if you speak about uh, the alternative, yes, right now uh, um, Russia uh, made a secret uh, information about uh, the export import um, about the export import. And first of all, it's about uh, it's because of uh, 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 gray scams, gray or black scams with uh, oil, and uh, with uh, they are uh, selling oil. Uh, uh, first of all, as far as I understand, for India and uh, for some other countries. Thank you. Uh, we can now go to another question from David Wolf. Um, as an historian, he writes, um, as a historian, um, I think that time is a factor that works either for or against you. Uh, in which ways is time in favor or against Russia? And in which ways is time for or against Ukraine? Um, he asked that your analysis be broken down to the short term and midterm. So whose side is time on? Uh, if you speak about uh, if you speak about the war, if you speak about uh, the Donbass, uh, the time the time is against Ukraine and against Russia. Against Ukraine because uh, Russia is uh, one hundred forty million people. Ukraine is only thirty five million people. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they have a big uh, possibility to mobilize a lot of people for this war. Uh, if you speak about why it's good for us, because two months ago uh, nobody believes, believed that uh, we'll fight against Russia more than two days. Uh, one month ago nobody believed that uh, there will be a, a heavy weapon uh, for Ukraine. Uh, right now, uh, we think that, uh, and, right, and, and two weeks ago, uh, Russia decided uh, to have a, a victory uh, parade in Mariupol, uh, and uh, they decided to do a uh, victory uh, on, on nine uh, on the day, day of Russian victory, day of uh, nine of May, uh, made a uh, parade uh, in Donetsk, in Mariupol, in Moscow, and so on. So on. Uh, two days ago, uh, Pushirin, he's a, a chairman of uh, DNR, uh, Donetsk National Republic, uh, told that uh, it's impossible to do uh, a victory parade on uh, 9th, uh, 9th of May. And that is why it's very difficult to tell uh, time is for Ukraine or time is for Russia. Time is against uh, <coughs> Russia and Ukraine, but we believe in our victory. Thank, uh, thanks. Um, the next question uh, comes again from uh, David Eric, and he asks, he says that Russia has taken protectionist measures 
in regards to the export of certain grains and fertilizer? What is the domestic uh, cost for such restrictions? Are they sustainable? Uh, how will they affect relations with low income countries uh, and importers of such commodities? I mean, I, I can say a few words. I don't yeah. know if uh, Ilya or Vadim, you want to. Um, I mean, I think clearly, you know, we are seeing, as you know, uh, you know, one of the major global impacts uh, from uh, from the conflict at the moment is that, uh, you know, the global uh, food prices are increasing and Russia is a major exporter as well as Ukraine, of course. Uh, Russia is still able to export. Uh, you know, while although the payment system remains to be, you know, unclear, you know, talking about all this, you know, gray, gray areas, because of course, you know, you have to pay, you know, have to make payments, a lot of those payments have been made via, you know, dollar or euro, and so it needs to be transferred into Russia. So, so a lot of those kind of challenges of exporting, you know, um, uh, uh, grain fertilizer, you know, in the developing world is related also to the indirect influence of sanctions. But clearly, you know, Russia would want to continue exporting them because, as you say, you know, they are exporting it to the key uh, friendly countries, so to speak, you know, Syria, for example, where if Russia stops exports of grain, uh, there, it's going to be, you know, potentially impacting the relationship, you know, Egypt, you know, as well as the Gulf states, um, you know, and other, you know, uh, countries that, you know, Russia is close to. So, so I, I don't think it is sustainable for Russia to uh, to introduce, you know, full restrictions, you know, on either of the fertilizer or, or grain. But I think they need to make sure that the payment system can be worked out. And I think this pause that we are seeing at the moment is really much more linked to um uh you know making sure that they can process that payment through the financial system uh rather than deliberate protective protection measures because i i don't think that is what is uh you know russia is not prevented uh, at the moment by sowing grain so and having another harvest uh, or, or you know manufacturing fertilizer uh, either in russia or belarus in fact because of the sanctions they actually have quite a lot more fertilizer that they can use for domestic market well, you see, uh, right now, uh, Ukraine planted, uh, planted uh, approximately 70% uh, of our territories uh, if we compare with uh, 2021. Uh, we don't know uh, how much uh, will gather it. Uh, we don't know about the uh, future uh, harvest uh, because uh, we don't know about uh, <coughs> the situation in the world. Uh, and we know that uh, only because of this war, uh, the prices of uh, grain uh, will be, uh, and fertilizers too, yes, uh, will be growing up. Uh, and uh, it will be one of the uh, main points of uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian chantage, uh, not only for Europe, uh, but uh, for, uh, uh, for the East, uh, for China, for India. Uh, for uh, Korea and a lot of countries who are uh, uh, net importers of uh, greens. Thanks. It's likely to generate a lot of uh, political instability and social unrest all around the world and of course contribute very substantially to inflation all over the world as well, including in the West, um, those kind of policies. Next question comes from uh, Renee and Nina know. Uh, she asks uh, a question, what would winning look like to the Ukrainian people? Is this a mince three type negotiated settlement or does victory mean expelling uh, Russian forces from all of Ukraine? Uh, uh, it's very difficult, uh, very difficult question. Uh, it will be very easy for us to tell you that uh, uh, we'll want to deoccupy uh, all Ukrainian territory, and yes, it's our dream, and uh, uh, we want to do it. Uh, but in general, we want to be realistic, uh, and uh, uh, we know that it's a very difficult war with a very big, a very huge uh, military system, and uh, with a system. Uh, who don't um, uh, who don't uh, the system which doesn't care 
uh, about their soldiers and about their uh, as about their army. You know that uh, as for me, it's the first war uh, in the history, in the whole history, uh, where one army don't want to bring bodies of their soldiers uh, from the battlefields. They don't want to do it. We have refrigerators with bodies of Russian soldiers. We told them, bring uh, these bodies to your uh, country and uh, uh, give these bodies to their mothers, uh, wives, uh, children. They don't want to do it. And that is why uh, you have to understand that uh, they don't need anything as, to, as a territory. They need a territory. And uh, they don't care about anybody, about people, about uh, uh, their uh, mothers, their wives, and so, so on. And that is why it's very difficult to tell you uh, what will be the victory. The victory, yes, the victory will be uh, the, the occupation of whole uh, Ukraine. But they don't know if it will be in this year or in a 25 years. Yeah, right now, I could also add just a few, go ahead. A couple, go ahead, a couple of sentences. I mean, right now, uh, we are focusing it, I mean, realistically and ideally, I mean, as part of this realistic mm -hmm. scenario, we're focusing on at least withdrawing Russian uh, forces to pre-24th uh, February lines. So, so just, you know, to for them to make them withdraw to uh, their positions prior to when the invasion started, because... Uh, really, the problems of deoccupying all the territory of Ukraine is 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 is, it's, is far more difficult than just you know a matter on on the battle that can be resolved in the battlefield, and so this will be the ideal. I think the minimum package, let's say, uh, which could be ideally reached right now. I mean, in the near future, is of course Russia's withdrawing their troops, and we are you know returning to status quo that existed. Uh, before the invasion, the, the invasion. But this is something that, again, I mean, it's really, really very hard to, to forecast right now, especially now when we are still in the phase of an active uh, combat. So the situation is very dynamic. We, we really don't know what will happen tomorrow in the battlefield because uh, we are, we're still not in the phase when even uh, peace negotiations started. So we had peace consultations, prior consultations, which was well, practically, you know, trying to understand each other's, you know, initial positions, but the real, tangible, serious peace negotiations, they haven't even, even really started yet. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, our next question comes from William Better, and he asked a question for Oksana, and he asks, how would you choose to tailor uh, sanctions to achieve uh, a ceasefire and, and how? Yes, I mean, it is a, an important question, but of course, you know, so far, and I, I here agree uh, with Ilya completely that, uh, you know, what we've seen in the last uh, few weeks, you know, uh, all these meetings in, this, in, in Istanbul and in Belarus, you know, they were just uh, kind of, a, a, you know, starting positions, but uh, in any of, none of those talks uh, talked a lot about sanctions at all. So, you know, the question is to what extent, um, and, and I think the position of European Union and the United States at the moment is that it's really up to Ukraine um, to decide, you know, to what extent, you know, some sort of sanctions, incremental sanctions relief or incremental sanctions conditionality can be or should be uh, integrated into those talks or, or, or not, you know, and I think at the moment we do not have an answer. Uh, from the Ukrainian side. I think we are still very much at the phase of conflict escalation as we discussed, and therefore it is certainly felt that it's not a time to even start mentioning how you know, sanctions can be used both as a punishment, as a deterrence, as I mentioned before, or as an incentive uh, for Russia to sit at the negotiating table. And, and it's too early at this stage, uh, you know, in, in the next few months, it's still very much everything will be decided on the battlefield. But I think as we progress towards the second half of the year, and hopefully by that stage, uh, you know, we will see the impact of sanctions. I think there will be 
um, uh, questions asked, you know, to what extent sanctions should be part of the negotiating process and how, and can you incentivize, can you create, because, you know, remember during the Minsk process, Minsk II, there was this uh, conditionality attacks attached to sanctions at that time for the full implementation of the Minsk agreements. And we know that the Minsk agreements have never been implemented, nor was there anything done with the sanctions. And already then, you know, there was quite a lot of question marks of sustaining the unity among Europeans and, and the United States. You know, what are we going to do in the current environment? You know, if we think about the conflict carrying on for quite a few months, we have ceasefire agreement. And there is nothing related to sanctions, you know, can we uh, make sure, uh, and particularly if, you know, Russia continues to develop its economic relationship with India, its economic relationship with China, um, its economic relationship with other emerging economies, you know, will that uh, unity be sustained if we do not think about how to be much more strategic about sanctions, you know, how do we really adjust that sanctions approach to every phase of this conflict. Uh, and I don't think at the moment we, we are talking about it at all. Uh, and as I said, you know, if we then look into the longer term, how do we make sure that the sanctions help us to implement this agreement? Because in my view, as hard as it is going to be to uh, reach a ceasefire agreement, implementation will be even harder and take even longer. Uh, and, and then, of course, the third phase, as I mentioned before, how do we use the sanctions to transform Russia? And that is not even realistically being discussed at the moment. I could also, yeah, I would like ahead, to, yeah. To, to, to yeah, say brief, some uh, uh, brief, on that. Brief, brief comment. Yeah, uh, brief comment. I, I, I totally agree with, with what Oksana said. It's really very important because uh, in our one of our latest uh, publications in, on, on our website in the, on, in the Institute, where we were discussing post-war Ukraine, what will be you know, in Ukraine, what, what can we do about Ukraine after war, what are our immediate objectives? And we recommended that the sanction policy should be adapted by Ukrainian government. So, I mean, there are sanctions which are imposed by the West, by the US separately, by the European Union separately. So these are two different mechanisms, two different in instruments and, and legislations. And they have their perceptions, their, I mean, understanding. And I think they would also come to some kind of sanction strategy, I hope, in, in the near future. And, but there are also, there is, well, Ukraine also should think about how to adapt sanctions, how to link them to the, uh, to, to the peace process and to uh, what is happening in Ukraine. Because sanctions with no purpose, they would not do any good. And as we have we had uh, several historical examples I mean recent historical examples like in, in Iran sometimes or in Syria even part of sanctions against Syria uh, because they didn't don't link they're not linked to some certain processes which are understandable to all parties you know we have this situation when when everything is deadlocked and no one understands what is the strategy of getting out of the conflict so I think, of course, this is very important for Ukrainian government to understand that to adapt sanctions, to understand how to link them with certain steps Russia should take from their side if they want to de-escalate in some moment. Right now, they don't want to, apparently, but maybe they will come to that. And also, as well, for other countries uh, to maybe pressure Russia to make this, because, for example, there are certain countries, like we, we already discussed this, the grain crisis in the world because of the war. And there are countries such as the Middle Eastern countries, China and India, Pakistan, and other countries which are reliant on, on imports of wheat uh, you know, from Ukraine and Russia. And they will have also, well, they will understand what should be done, for example, what how they could pressure Russia into certain steps that would unlock part of this uh, part of uh, trade and economic relations between them and Russia, you know, for their sake, for their uh, interests, maybe this would also give them incentives to participate in, you know, building, uh, in, in, in building trust mechanisms and, you know, participating in this peace process when, when we will come to this moment, because right now, as we said, we are not, we're not in that phase. You talked about the resilience of Putin. Uh, but obviously, a lot of Russians are going to former Soviet states or to Europe. Uh, to what extent do you think the diaspora will kind of unite uh, to form a opposition in exile 
or is that just something that is not realistic going forward? Vadim, should I start or, or do you want to start? Yes, yes, please, yes, please. Uh, I don't, I don't, at least for now, I don't see that Russians who uh, left Russia, you know, they are starting you know, some kind of large scale opposition movement. Uh, because, you know, many of them think that, you know, this will end soon. Many of them uh, are, you know, for example, many, many people who left for Armenia or Georgia, they are IT specialists, for example, many of them like who are who moved because they couldn't work in, in Russia because of sanctions, but they could work from neighboring countries. So, I mean, for an opposition movement, which is for tangible opposition movement to form, you need resources, you need leaders, you need a strategy, a vision of what, what do you want to propose to different social groups in Russia. And ideally, of course, it's, I mean, uh, it's, it's having access to, to appeal to Russians immediately. So this is, this is something that many, uh, many Russians abroad lack. They don't have access to appeal to Russians directly. The only opposition figure that had this kind and have till today, but he's in jail, this kind of access is Alexei Navalny. So this is something, this is something that made him stronger uh, when he returned to Russia because he could appeal to masses inside Russia, you know, directly. But I don't see any other strong opposition figures right now abroad who could, you know, who could uh, bring all these, all these, you know, components into one and form something that could, from abroad, I mean, try to uh, win over Russians when fighting for the system. You see, I don't believe uh... In any uh, possibility of Russian diaspora uh, for uh, a big uh, political future in Russia. Uh, they are very good uh, in diaspora, they are very good in uh, Western Europe. Uh, they have uh, a very smart uh, representatives, but uh, they are not. Uh, not only popular in uh, Russia, uh, in general, they are uh, enemies for uh, a lot of, uh, maybe for 80, 90% of Russia, Russians. And that is why I don't believe in any uh, future for uh, political movements, Russian uh, political movements in diaspora. Okay, thank you, Vadim. Thank you, Ilya, and thank you, Oksana. We've come to the end of our time, but I want to thank you for uh, the report and for all your insights into uh, the Russian uh, economy and the role of sanctions in the global uh, uh, global markets. So, thanks, everybody. Thank you for uh, thank you to for to our attendees for listening, and I hope you follow the Kennan Institute on our other uh, media and events. Thanks very much, and we'll bring the proceedings to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.